what is going on everybody welcome back to another monday night raw retro review this time from august 9th 1993 this is episode 29 so we're one episode away from the 30th edition of raw that didn't make any sense but anyway the show starts off with vince and the crew telling us what's going to be on the show tonight but i prefer them to just cancel the show because everything that they said was going to happen was completely garbage i didn't want to see any of it but I'm going to check it out so that you don't have to and review it here. So our first match is Tatanka versus Mr. Hughes. They botch that leapfrog jump over spot. Then we see some guy who looked like Gorilla Monsoon. But we see a far shot of this guy bringing out a wreath once again to ringside. I say it looked like him because it did. But we couldn't really tell if it was him or not. So yeah. But I think it was Gorilla Monsoon. Then after a commercial, there's some obvious piped in crowd noise because the crowd is not reacting. But we hear loud boos and cheers like if there's a million people in the crowd. Tatanka body drops Hughes on the outside and gets the win via countout. And if you have to go back and watch this show for whatever reason, if you want to go and check this out, you have to listen to this shit. Because WWF is so bad at editing, WWE, whatever. The fake crowd noise, and even in 2020, they still don't know how to do it. The fake crowd noise is so loud that you can barely hear what the commentary is saying. Mr. Hughes then nails Tatanka with the urn after the match and destroys the wreath over his body. This show is already off to a bad start because of the crowd noise. It's that bad. We then get another confidential interview with Lex Luger, but the stupid edits made it hard to pay attention. They would do random cuts to a close-up of his mouth or forehead. Made no sense. Luger talked about following his dream of becoming a pro football player. He played three years in the CFL, two in the NFL, and he even played in the USFL. Then he talks about life after football and getting into the wrestling business. We are going to be getting a contract signing a little later between Luger and Yokozuna for SummerSlam, so we'll get back to that in a little bit. Then we have a six-man tag match that I'm glad were just a bunch of nobodies, and I was able to skip it. It's the Bushwhackers and the Little Macho Man, if you recall who that was, versus Brooklyn Brawler and half of the Beverly Brothers and a random little person. The match went on for way too long. I did skip it, but, you know, sometimes you actually pay attention to how long you skipped it was just way too long for this match to go the bushwhacker team did pick up the win for whatever reason so let's move on next up we have the contract signing for the SummerSlam WWF title match Jim Cornette made his way down with Yokozuna and Fuji as an American spokesman slash interpreter for them which actually doesn't make any sense because I don't believe that Cornette speaks Japanese or Samoan for that matter they also have like 10 random people that have nothing to do with this match in the ring. An additional clause that Luger and his lawyer obviously didn't get a chance to relook over. I am no legal consultant whatsoever, but that sounds a little sketchy and illegal to me. If you just draw something up into the contract and don't even give your guys, the, the people that are signing the contract, a chance to look over it before they sign it. But Lex Luger signed it anyway, so it's his fault, I guess. The calls just stated that Luger would never get a rematch if he lost. Lex says that he's going to bring the belt back to the United States. But last time I checked, Yokozuna has actually been on American soil for WWF TV more with the belt than Hulk Hogan the real American was when he was the champ a couple months ago. But whatever, I get what they're trying to say. And that was basically the end of it. They just signed it, stared at each other for a couple seconds, and then that was it. So, moving on, we have Racer Ramon taking on a jobber, and he gets the win with the Racer's Edge as he's getting ready for SummerSlam to face Ted DiBiase. We then get our first look at Cornette's team from Smoky Mountain Wrestling, the Heavenly Bodies, and they're taking on some local enhancement guys. They had some impressive moves, the jobber guys were not great, but if they're taking on the Steiner Brothers, I think that match should be good. The crowd was not into this debut though, so I don't know. The crowd usually helps a match go from decent to good, and maybe even great. But the WWF crowd can also kill a match. Because sometimes if they don't know a certain superstar, they'll just sit on their hands and knees, basically. Wait, is that even the saying, sit on their hands and knees? How does that make any sit on your hands? You can't sit on your knees. Is that the saying? Please let me know in the comments. That might be the case at SummerSlam, but good match on paper, like I said. And that actually is pretty much it for Raw. So let's get to the awards. For the best moment... Okay, so we are 29 episodes in, and I think I've been fair by giving out best awards on more than one occasion where they didn't really deserve it. So, I'm done with that because there was nothing really worth checking out on this episode. So, best moment, there was none. 
For the worst moment, I had the little macho man making another appearance. Why is he back? Why is he here? Just enough. Worst match, I had Tatanka versus Mr. Hughes. These guys are both not over. And then even with that, the crowd noise, it wasn't even leveled properly, like I said. It ruined the match even more. And then even more to how bad this was. It ended via countout, but then Tatanka, the winner, still got beaten up at the end. I hate it when they do that, so yeah, worst match, Tatanka, Mr. Hughes, for all that nonsense that was going on through it. For the best match, the Jobbers were completely out of their game this night, so I can't even give it to an enhancement match. So another award, I'm going to leave just completely vacant. For the wackest performer, I'm going to give that to the producers on this show. The sounds, the visuals were all over the place. The first time I'm even acknowledging them for how bad this show was. For the standout performer, I'm going to give that to Racer Ramon because he was on the show. So, yeah, I'll give it to him. Pause. This show was obviously not worth the watch, so that's going to be another tally going into the Bad Raws. That's two weeks in a row now, and we have two weeks or so until SummerSlam. I remember the go-home show for WrestleMania 9 being bad. We might be seeing that again for another Big Four pay-per-view. If you know why Raw didn't really put enough eggs in their basket for these go-home shows, can you please let me know, like, why was it that these shows, especially going into a pay-per-view, didn't really feel any special or any hype to them? If you were watching back then in 1993 live, please let me know. I want to know why they didn't build these Raws to mean anything. But with that being said, I'm out. I'll catch you guys next time.